unofficially known as uh, not the sales guy at Exonic. What it means is that it is uh, one of my key responsibilities to tell the world about the new products that we're creating and how great we think they are. Uh, but uh, I don't do that from a sales background, but from a technical background. I've been a Java programmer for many years and I also do some uh, coding at uh, Exonic myself. Uh, Exonic is uh, still a quite new company focused on Exxon Framework. We were founded last year in July. Uh, so Exxon Framework has been around much longer. Uh, it's a very mature open source Java framework for event-driven microservices. Uh, last month we hit 700k uh, downloads uh, uh, in total, so we're very happy with that. We currently do about 70k per month. Um, Exonic is a company around Exxon Framework and we basically do two things. One is to create a number of commercial software products uh, that work uh, in addition and in conjunction with uh, the open source Exxon Framework. Uh, and we also do things like support and training focused on Exxon Framework. Today will be about our newest product, Exxon Hub, uh, currently in beta, it's a beta release. Uh, if you've attended one of our previous presentations, you may have seen that referred to as uh, the messaging platform in our roadmaps, uh, but we decided to rename it into Exxon Hub, which is a lot nicer to pronounce and more, uh, more easy to remember, I guess. Um, it's the third of our products that we're launching in addition to Exxon Framework, the other ones being Exxon DB and the Exxonic uh, GDPR module. Uh, stuff that we still have on our roadmap and that will leverage what we currently have done with Exxon Hub is, uh, is monitoring and analytics uh, functionality. Although you will see that in Exxon Hub, there's already uh, a lot of interesting monitoring stuff present. Um, and at some point we're planning to do a SaaS based delivery of DB and Hub. Currently it's all on-premise software that you can run in a cloud yourself if you want to, uh, but it's not a software as a service yet, but at some point it will be. Um, the agenda for today, I'd like to start by talking a bit about the vision behind Exxon Hub, why we created this and why we believe it's a great component within the Exxon Framework ecosystem. Uh, after that, uh, zoom into the actual product a little bit more. How did we design this? What are the key decisions that we made when setting this up? Um, then we'll do a demo, uh, actually looking at how to deploy a microservices system using Exxon Hub, looking at the code and uh, deployment scenario. And then um, the final part will be to show you how to get started with this yourself uh, if you would like to. So where can you download the stuff uh, and how, what you should, should you do to install it? Starting with the vision. Um, Exxon Hub is all about microservices. And we know that many organizations today are working towards microservices architectures. Some are already there, uh, which is put very shortly, it's about splitting up systems into smaller parts. Uh, and there are two main drivers why you would like to do that. So one very important driver is agility. If you have one big monolith and you have to deploy that uh, at once, uh, then you cannot change it often because the deployment process becomes very complex. The testing process becomes very complex. And if you have very small services, you could potentially make new releases of those with new business functionality uh, a lot more often. And the second key driver is scalability. Microservices should support having multiple instances of the same service uh, in parallel, so you get horizontal scalability. And when you have split up your system into many different uh, independently working components, you can scale those independently uh, together making a very scalable system. Um, if you look at those key drivers, agility and scalability, you could derive what kind of requirements you would pose on any kind of microservices implementation. So uh, one of those things is that you should probably align microservices quite closely with business functions. The reason is that if, if business functions and microservices don't have that correspondence, then making a change in the business functionality might lead to a change in a large group of microservices, which would then have to be deployed at the same time, effectively making a kind of uh, distributed monolith rather than a true agile microservices system. Uh, you need to have uh, autonomous operation of the microservices. Again, for the same reason, you should be able to, they should be able to function and run independently rather than uh, being a part of a distributed monolith. Uh, you should have many instances of the same service potentially without running into problems associated with that. Uh, so statelessness is largely preferred. Uh, that all works towards the scalability aspect. Uh, 
the microservices themselves should be very easy to deploy, to start up, to, to update. In other words, they should uh, fit into an agile or DevOps environment. Because if you don't have that, then you are never going to get the agility, which was one of the key drivers of microservices in the first place. Um, for similar reasons, should run well in a cloud environment. You don't have to do microservices in the cloud, obviously, uh, but the scalability associated with cloud environments on the infrastructure level is a really nice match with the things that you're trying to achieve with a microservices application architecture. So uh, your microservices system should reasonably uh, function well in a cloud environment. Uh, and again, for the scalability, you want asynchronicity. If everything is linked through synchronous calls, uh, you don't get high scalability. You effectively have a distributed monolith from many uh, perspectives. So messaging should largely be asynchronous. Now, if we take these requirements, there's a lot of stuff that's that's actually not on that list, but still often associated with microservices. Uh, in particular, there's nothing in this list uh, which is about HTTP or any other particular transport protocol. It's a core part of a vision. We, do, we strongly believe that microservices are not about HTTP. Uh, there's also no limit on lines of code. Uh, we don't believe that microservices are defined by having uh, at maximum 1,000 lines of code or similar things. It's also not defined by a certain framework. It's great to create microservices with Exxon uh, or any other framework, but it's not, not in any way a defining aspect. The things to the left, those are important because they really support agility and scalability. Now, so we've seen that microservices are a great place to be at once you're there, then you do have these great benefits. So how to get there? Um, now here we see two very interesting quotes from Martin Fowler on this topic. So the first quote is, almost all the successful microservices stories have started with a monolith that got too big and was broken up. So start with a monolith, break it up. Um, on the other hand, on microservices systems, almost all the cases where I've heard of a system that was built as a microservice system from scratch, it has ended up in serious trouble. Now that's very recognizable. There are some very clear reasons for that. Uh, once you start building something as a microservices system from day one, uh, that will lead to um, a massive focus on infrastructure and all kinds of cool technology, uh, detracting from the focus that the team should have on on creating value for the business. And that's just a very bad way to start, uh, start a project. Also in the beginning of a project, it may be very unclear what, what uh, appropriate boundaries of microservices uh, should be. What are the logical business domains that function independently? So it's quite understandable why starting out with a microservices system is, uh, is a dangerous idea. Now, on the other hand, um, what should you do? So should you start building a monolith and then split it up? There's a problem with that as well. Uh, and that's not a quote from Martin Fowder. It's just a quote from uh, like every time you write a conference and talk to people. Um, it is very, very difficult to take a legacy monolith, just any monolith, and then split it into microservices. There is no magic bullet to do that and may take years in many practical cases. So what should you do? Well, our vision is that the best approach to microservices is an evolutionary approach. So you start writing a structured monolith. It's a monolith, but it has structure in it. So you can split it up in Microsoft services if you want to. And that's exactly what you're going to do uh, as and when you need it, uh, which can take multiple steps and take uh, ever uh, finer uh, uh, grains of services uh, as circumstances demand. So this is what we want to support with Excel Framework. Uh, some key properties about a structured monolith. Um, we believe it should follow DDD principles, both on a large scale, strategically thinking about bounded contexts and, and those kinds of concepts, but also in terms of building blocks, uh, having aggregates and, and domain events and similar things. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, we've seen that microservices should be aligned with the business to have agility on long term. Um, and it can only work uh, if your structured monolith already has that same kind of structure that the various parts of the monolith um, uh, do fit into those uh, business aligned microservices later on. Uh, there should be explicit messaging uh, between components. 
Uh, and when doing that messaging, the system should make no assumptions about locality. So even if, because it's a monolith, in reality, technically, those messages will just stay in the JVM. Um, but the monolith should be written in such a way that they could actually go over the wire as actual messages uh, without changing the code of your monolith. Also, there should be no assumptions about synchronicity. Uh, even within the JVM, if you're still in one process, um, the communication between components should be asynchronous. Because if you already have written your program in such a way that this works, the messaging can actually become asynchronous when it goes over the wire later on and nothing will have to change. Uh, so a monolith like this that follows these principles can easily be split up. Uh, and this is exactly what we enable with Axon Framework. You can build a monolith using these principles. Now, when it, the time comes to scale out your system, uh, you should start uh, exchanging messages on some kind of messaging system like RabbitMQ or, or, or similar. Um, and on a certain sense, you could say, well, commands, events, and queries are all messages, so that should work. But what we see in reality is that this works particularly well for event messages, uh, but not so much for the other ones. So what you get as a result right now is that real life distributed uh, systems with Axon or without Axon tend to use uh, a mix of integration patterns, or there could be uh, there's messaging uh, like Rabbit or Kafka, uh, quite often also synchronous uh, HTTP calls to REST APIs, uh, combined with all kinds of discovery and, and load balancing mechanisms. So the overall infrastructure that you have to make your distributed system work can become quite complex and very hard to manage. Uh, what we also see is that because of this, this fact that traditional messaging systems work particularly well for events and not so much for the other things, um, events and messages are sometimes seen as, as almost as synonyms. Um, our belief is that messages and events are definitely not the same thing. Uh, events just represent one of various stereotypes of messages. The key thing that defines an event is that it describes something that has happened in the past. That's what an event is. And it can be communicated as messages. The other messages that you will also have in a CQRS and event source based system are commands and queries. These are all messages. The thing that sets them apart is how they should be routed. If we look at events in the middle, an event should be distributed to all logical event handlers that are interested in that event message. So that's a very nice fit with the pub sub functionality that most uh, event queue or me most message use would offer. So that, that, that explains the nice fit. If you would look at command and query uh, routing patterns, they're different. Uh, commands should always be routed to exactly one handler. You don't want a command to be executed twice. Um, when doing that routing, uh, it's good to use consistent hashing to determine the actual instance that's going to process the command, because that will ensure that the same instance of a command handler will process commands targeting the same aggregate. Uh, and this in turn will enable that instance of the command handler to keep a warm cache of those, uh, of those aggregates, uh, reducing the, the uh, time spent retrieving events from the event store, replaying them, uh, and recreating the aggregate instance. Uh, also typical about commands is that you get a result. The command may, uh, may either succeed or fail, and if it succeeds, you may also get some data about uh, what happened. Uh, at the query side, to the right, uh, you also have the same aspect like commands that you don't want to fan them out to everybody, uh, but in principle have one instance answer them. Uh, there are a few subtle differences with how commands should be routed. With queries, uh, you don't really have a notion of consistent hashing or consistent routing. You basically want to do load balancing. And although in most cases you want one instance to handle the query, that's not always the case. Sometimes there are things that uh, are generically called scatter garter queries, but it could be that you want to have the best answer to a query or the, the lowest price for a particular product or the fastest result or the fastest result within 100 milliseconds from various potential uh, instances that could answer that query. So queries in the simplest case are similar to commands, but in more advanced cases have, really have their own kinds of routing patterns. Uh, so uh, our vision is that 
all of these is messaging. It's not just about events, it's all messaging. Uh, the only thing that really changes is the routing pattern. Um, but you should be able to handle all of this using a unified messaging mechanism rather than having totally different technologies for these three types of messages. Now, to get work, the uh, routing platform needs a certain amount of intelligence. And the best way to explain our vision is to contrast uh, the intelligence that's behind Exxon Hub with intelligence in some alternative messaging platforms. So here we've created a spectrum from very uh, low intelligence systems to the left to very high intelligence systems on the right. And a typical example of the system on the right is the enterprise service bus. Uh, we're very popular like 10, 15 years ago, not so much anymore now. Um, key characteristic of these enterprise service buses were that they were very actively looking into message payload, uh, being able to make decisions dependent on what they would see there, uh, maybe even doing actual transformations of the messages or implement some some business logic. A lot of intelligence can do a lot of things, but very hard to manage and tend to become a bottleneck and definitely um, not support the agility that we're looking for today. Uh, so what we're seeing now is that the market generally has made a move all the way to the left uh, with message queues being very popular, uh, Kafka being one of the most uh, 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 use new technologies right now, relatively new technologies. And the key thing about these message queues is that they, they do some useful stuff. They give you guaranteed delivery. Uh, they give a few uh, distributing patterns like competing consumers and, and pops up. But they don't look into the message itself. Because they don't look into the message and because they don't understand the differences between commands, events, and queries, uh, they will never be able to uh, implement those routing patterns that we see are characteristic of these three types of events. And events tend to work quite well with the kind of messaging patterns that they have to offer, uh, but commands and queries don't. And if you're going to try to um, uh, to get your commands and queries to be distributed over this, this message queuing technology, uh, you're going to either have to do a lot of manual work to configure everything, or it's going to fail altogether. It's it's a hard thing to do. Now, what we believe is that there is a very interesting sweet spot in the middle there, but definitely to the left of the middle. Uh, and that's where we have uh, Exxon Hub. Uh, so what we want to do with Exxon Hub is understand the stereotypes, understand what commands, events, and queries are, understand some of the key metadata, like which command is in a command message, which command type, uh, and which aggregate is it pointing at. Um, so we can do the routing, and it should understand those routing patterns, but it doesn't look in the actual message payload and doesn't make decisions based on what's in that payload. And that distinguishes it, distinguishes it very clearly from an enterprise service bus, because we don't want it to end up there, given what we know about how that ended up. So that's all the vision. Uh, let's have a look at how that vision uh, has been transformed to an actual design of our system. Uh, looking at the essentials, just to be very clear about what it is technically. Uh, so Exxon Hub is a server system that we distribute as a jar, uh, so you can run it yourself. Um, and uh, so the jar is, is commercial software, closed source, but with the jar comes an open source uh, Exxon Hub client, which is available in source form on GitHub and um, uh, is also available as a Maven dependency. It's a unifor, unified messaging system for commands, events, and queries, and it's asynchronous. It's always asynchronous. Uh, you can, of course, decide to wait for a particular reply to come in your client code, just so you get a synchronous interaction there. But on the uh, Exxon Hub level, it's always asynchronous messaging. Uh, it has the intelligence to do correct routing uh, with near zero configuration. That's the key benefit of it. It's very easy to scale out and distribute an Exxon application using Exxon Up. Uh, and in that way, it enables this painless evolution of a structured monolith into a microservices system. So it's a key enabler of our vision of evolutionary microservices. Uh, you can already uh, scale out the microservices with the current uh, Exxon Framework open source offerings, but it's quite painful to do, and Exxon Hub makes that a lot easier. Um, on the transport level, 
looking at how Exxon application components work with Exxon Up. We've chosen to use gRPC, which is technically uh, protobuf binary serialization over HTTP2. And importantly, the connections are always initiated by the application components. The application components connect to the hub and not the other way around. There's some very uh, clear benefits to this, uh, to this choice. So first of all, the choice of gRPC and HTTP2 leads to full two-way communications. So of course, one party has to establish the connection, but after that, it's fully two-way and both Exxon Hub can send messages to uh, the application component and the other way around. Um, because the connection is always initiated by the application component, uh, you don't need to make your components discoverable or you don't need to register them anywhere or something or put them behind a load balancer. The simple fact that they connect to the Exxon Hub, that's what makes them discoverable later on. So that's really easy. Um, also, gRPC is very efficient. Uh, it's, uh, it's binary. Uh, Protobuf is an efficient serialization protocol, and HTTP2 is a lot more efficient than plain uh, HTTP1. Um, and of course, this transport implementation is open. So the Exxon uh, hub client is open source. You could uh, port that to other environments. Uh, gRPC has a wide range of implementations also for other, uh, for .NET or, 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 or Node.js. So potentially all these systems could work with Exxon hub as well. Uh, it's not uh, a very uh, strong vendor lock-in or anything like that. Looking at it from an application programming perspective, uh, let's first have a look at uh, how it works for a monolith before we introduce Exxon Hub. Uh, and here as, as an example, I'm talking about command handlers. Uh, I could equivalently have talked about query handlers or event handlers. It's, they work exactly the same way. Um, I've just picked one to, uh, to make it easier to create the example. So if you would have a monolithic Exxon application, you would have a set of command handlers. They uh, depend on the fact that you have a command bus implementation, a command bus bean somewhere uh, in your Exxon system. Uh, and the command handlers, they register uh, to the command bus. Now, the, the implementation of the command bus interface uh, uh, is by default a simple command bus, which just relays the command messages inside the JVM and does so uh, synchronously. Now, what you can do to scale out is uh, remove that simple command bus uh, and then replace it by an Exxon Hub command bus. Uh, and the nice thing is, is this nothing has to change in the code itself. The Exxon Hub command bus will take care of the communication with Exxon Hub. And the way that you do this, uh, the easiest way of doing it is to use the Exxon Hub Spring Boot Auto Configure uh, Maven dependency. Uh, then all of this uh, will work automatically. Uh, alternatively, we also have a non-Spring Boot client, uh, in which case you would have to uh, wire up that uh, command bus explicitly. Uh, and there's essentially just one configuration property that you need. Uh, that's the network location of Exxon Hub. The initiative for communication will be with the application component. So the application component has to know where uh, Exxon Hub can be found. So it's a very easy programming model. So how does it work? Well, so when an application has an Exxon Hub uh, bus, and I've put a wildcard there because the same the, the same process could uh, work for command bus, event bus, or query bus. Uh, actually, two things happen once such a bus is configured. So first of all, um, when later on an application, the application puts a message on that bus, uh, that bus implementation will send it to Exxon Hub, and then Exxon Hub will further process it. Uh, the second thing that happens is that this application also actively informs Exxon Hub about which handlers it has, so which command, query, or event handlers. Uh, and therefore, Exxon Hub knows that this application component has become a candidate to receive a particular type of message. Um, so if you combine this, this way of working from the client with the fact that Exxon Hub understands uh, message metadata, it understands routing patterns, it has two-way gRPC connections. All of that together enables fully automatic routing uh, as well as monitoring and management functionality uh, on your messaging. Exxon Hub has a relation with Exxon DB. Uh, Exxon Hub itself doesn't store events at all. It's, uh, it's uh, nearly stateless, so it needs an event store for storing events. Um, 
XonDB is Exonix built for purpose event store. You may have seen it in our previous webinar. It's already uh, production now. We have various customer use, customers using it in production. Uh, it's essentially a high performance event store where the performance is independent of the number of events that you already have stored, which is a big contrast with a relational database, which becomes slower as tables grow. Uh, it has a very interesting feature that's very important also for Exxon Hub is in that it actively pushes events to tracking event processors, where with a relational database, tracking event processors would be implemented by polling on a database and therefore introduce delay in event processing. Uh, and it also has an ad hoc querying interface. So when you use Exxon Hub with Exxon DB, uh, Exxon Hub would have the connection with Exxon DB. Uh, Exxon Hub will take in commands, events, and queries from the application components um, and store them to Exxon DB if they're events. Uh, but the application components wouldn't have a direct connection with ExxonDB anymore. Uh, right now, we actually do need ExxonDB for event processing. So you cannot do event processing with Exxon Hub without ExxonDB. Uh, what you can do uh, is uh, use Exxon Hub for commands uh, and or queries uh, and keeping events out of Exxon Hub altogether if you, if you for some reason need to use a different event store implementation. Um, right now, it's also the case that uh, events that are going through Exxon Hub are always persisted in ExxonDB. So all, all events are actually stored. Uh, some plans that we have on the roadmap uh, are to support non-ExxonDB event stores behind Exxon Hub. So for instance, if you want to use uh, MySQL as an event store, you should be able to do that in combination with Exxon Hub as well. Um, and also support for uh, non-persistent events, also called ephemeral events, uh, through Exxon Hub. Um, so right now, uh, you should use it in combination with ExxonDB, which is a very great, easy to set up and extremely scalable combination. So it's highly recommended. Let's go to the uh, demo. Um, the domain that we've chosen for a demo uh, is gift cards. Uh, and the reason uh, that we've chosen gift cards is that they are really uh, simple as a domain. Basically, there are just two operations. They get issued at a certain initial value when someone buys the gift card. Then you give away the gift card and someone starts it to use it to, uh, to buy stuff. So that's redeeming and then you adjust the remaining value on the gift card. Uh, that's all there is. So it's a beautiful example to, uh, to highlight some of the Exxon framework features without having complex code. Uh, we created a small uh, GUI for this application. Uh, so this is a screenshot. You see to the left uh, a panel to issue a card at a certain amount, uh, to the right a panel to redeem a card at a certain amount, and below we see a table with cards that have been issued, their initial value and their remaining value uh, after their uh, redeems. Um, the code of this application is publicly available on our GitHub, uh, so you can check it out yourself in detail if you want to. We split this out into microservices, of course. Uh, there are three different ones. So there is a web user interface, of which we just saw the screenshot, a gift card GUI. Uh, gift card command is the microservice that contains the gift card aggregate. And gift card query contains the read model. So GUI sends commands and queries to the command and query service. Command has an event sourced aggregate, so it interacts with the event store. Events also get published to GC query, uh, so query can update the read model accordingly. So this is our setup. For the technology stack of our application, uh, we of course have Exxon 3. Um, in addition, we have Spring Boot, we have Docker, we have Kubernetes, we have Google Cloud. Now, none of that is required by Exxon Hub. So if you, if you want to use Exxon Hub, but you don't use these particular systems, that's not a problem at all. Uh, but they are a really great fit for uh, microservices systems, so, so that's why we've chosen them for a demo as well. So let's uh, let's go to the actual live demo. Um, we'll start by having a look at the code. So uh, here is my gift card distributed project. It has a common project, which is not a service by itself, just some uh, shared uh, messages. And then there's the command GUI and query services. Looking into command, uh, we'll see that it's really simple. It's a Spring Boot application with nothing uh, nothing special in here. Uh, it's an aggregate. Uh, the aggregate is the standard uh, Exxon aggregate with two command handlers. 
to event sourcing handlers uh, and nothing which makes this a microservice at all. Um, the way that we expose this with uh, Exxon Hub is that here in the POM, we have the Exxon Hub Spring Boot Auto Configure. This will wire the uh, command bus and event bus needed by this application and link them to Exxon Hub. And then in our properties, we have uh, a name for the application. So it shows up nicely for Exxon Hub. Uh, and we need to tell it where the servers are, which will actually be overridden when we deploy this. Uh, something similar is here in the query model. Um, also, vanilla Spring Boot app, a component which has event handlers to update uh, a JPA managed database and query handlers to uh, provide answers to the queries needed by the Vaadin front end. So we're going to run this on our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I've already configured that, uh, but it's uh, totally empty now. So we have here um, the DB running on the Kubernetes cluster and we have hub running on the Kubernetes cluster. We can look into the hub GUI. Um, so there are zero events processed yet. Uh, and I can look at my architecture overview, which is very simple now. It's just the hub itself and uh, the ExxonDB sitting behind it during my application chat. So let's uh, deploy some of those applications. First, starting with the command handler. Um, I have uh, already uploaded a Docker image with my command jar uh, to the Google repository. So I can now just use kube control to run that uh, uh, command. So now it has uh, deployed the command component, and in a few seconds we should see it pop up in the Exxon Hub architecture overview as well. So there it is. I can uh, zoom into that, and what we see now is we have a name of the instance, we see the Exxon Hub server it has connected to, and we see that this component can process two commands, redeem and issue. Uh, it has no query handlers and no event processors, which is all as expected. Uh, now, of course, we cannot really use this uh, yet, so let's also uh, deploy the GUI part. Um, and we're going to deploy the query part as well. So the query part should show up here as well. Takes a few seconds. There it is. Uh, the GUI part will not show up before we have uh, done a first command on the actual GUI because it has no reason to, it has no handlers by itself, so it doesn't subscribe to the Exxon app in the same way. Uh, currently, uh, we've, we're creating a load balancer for the GUI, it's there. Um, so here we have uh, uh, the GUI that we just saw on the screenshot. Uh, it's now also uh, here because it has uh, sent out its first messages to query for current uh, cards and I can start using this so I can uh, do things like uh, issue a card and then it shows up here in the read model and I can redeem against the card and I will see that the remaining value is 90. Um, you can see some more information here. Um, you can count the number of commands that has been processed. We can uh, look into the read model. We see now that we have a tracking event processor. Um, we see the segment that it has claimed, uh, the kind of queries that can be processed here. Um, now there's a few interesting things I can do here. One of the things uh, is managing tracking event processors, which was an often requested feature in Exxon. Uh, we're going to further uh, enhance this functionality, but one of the things you can already do right now is pause this tracking event processor. So if we would press the pause button and confirm, uh, then now the tracking event processor would be, uh, would be on hold. And you can see that in the application. If I would uh, issue some more commands here, they would actually be totally processed as expected. Um, 
except that the query model doesn't get updated because the tracking event processor has been shut down. We can start it again. So now it's started. If I now refresh my read model, you can see that the remaining value is zero now because it has actually processed those events in the read model. So that's a lot of control on your tracking event processors in a really easy way. Uh, one of the other uh, things is fully automatic scaling. Um, if I go back to the overview, and I would ask uh, Kubernetes to uh, spin up uh, some more um, copies, replicas of my um, uh, GC command deployment. It's now scaling that, and you will see here that the number of instances is going to rise. Two, three, four. So now I have four instances of this handler. Um, by the way, these are spread across uh, several uh, independent data centers, so it has a high availability aspect to it as well. Um, we can now see the consistent routing in action. Uh, so now we see that all commands so far have been handled by a single handler. If I would uh, create a new name, like test two, and uh, say start with 1000 and process a series of commands against this aggregate as well. Uh, what we see here is that again, all uh, commands have been handled by a single command handler rather than being spread across. This is the consistent hashing in action because we were targeting the same aggregates, commands have been sent to the same handler instance so it can optimize its caches. If you would bulk issue cards of different names, um, what we would see then is that they are actually spread out across the cluster, so each command handler does its share. So we have quite uh, advanced command handling patterns there, and there's nothing you need to configure for it. Uh, it just works. Uh, so this is the main stuff I wanted to show you in the demo. Uh, let's go back to the slides. So if you want to get started with it yourself, um, good thing to know is that we have multiple editions available. Uh, just like we have for ExxonDB. Uh, there's a free developer edition, which does have all the intelligence that we have uh, regarding the routing patterns, so it can do this basic job. A um, uh, key limitation is that it doesn't have clustering, so you're limited to a single Exxon hub. So that works perfectly well for getting to know the product and starting developing with it, but we assume that most companies for production situations will want to have clustering for high availability. So that requires a paid standard or enterprise license. Uh, a couple of highlights. Um, we have quality of service on messages. I didn't demo it, but it is there. It is in there yet. So you can set priority of command messages uh, in the clients using any criteria that you see fit, uh, which has a couple of really great uh, applications. So for instance, if a system processes both batch commands as well as human or interactive usage at the same time, uh, if you process everything with same priority, uh, having a heavy batch may actually slow the system down from a human perspective. Uh, so you could, using this feature, uh, give those batch commands a lower priority and then humans could continue to work with the system as normal, even though a batch is running in the background. Uh, on the roadmap, we have uh, a node auto scaling trigger. So right now uh, in the demo, I showed you how to scale out uh, the command handlers manually with kube control. Uh, but ExxonNAP would actually know or could know when a particular function doesn't perform anymore uh, as quickly as it should, so when it's overloaded. And in that case, it could automatically, using some kind of hook, uh, uh, issue a command that you configure to increase the scale of a particular processor. Uh, so it's a pretty powerful feature. It's not in there yet, but it's on the roadmap. Um, another similar but not quite same feature is event processor auto scaling. Uh, since the latest version of Exxon, um, you can you actually have an API to determine the number of threads uh, in a tracking event press processor, uh, and that number of threads could be managed by Exxon Hub automatically, uh, and that has some great applications. For instance, if you uh, spin up a new read model, then initially it needs to process a vast amount of events just to uh, reach the current state. And after that, it has a lot less work to do. 
So Exxon Hub could detect that, uh, assign it many threats in the beginning uh, to catch up and then reduce that number of threats to avoid wasting resources later on. So based on the platform that we already have now, we have some really uh, cool features in mind that we're going to build on top of that in the near future. Uh, if you want to get started with it, uh, you can download the product from this URL. Uh, current version is release candidate one. Um, uh, we don't know exactly yet when we will release the general availability version, probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, we already have some projects using this right now in their projects and having experience with it in the private beta phase. Uh, that feedback is very good. Uh, so we don't uh, expect to be needing a long beta uh, uh, trial right now. Uh, the version that you can download now does have a few limitations. So we plan to have connectors with other messaging systems, uh, but that's not in yet. And the counter information that I just saw you about the number of commands uh, isn't synchronized over Exxon Hub instances yet uh, in clustered mode. Clustering by itself works totally fine. It's just that this information isn't synchronized yet. So the developer edition is free now. It will also be free after we go uh, general availability. Uh, but if you want to try out the other versions, uh, please contact us as well and then we can get you uh, a free uh, beta or evaluation license key. So that would be useful if you want to try out uh, the clustering, uh, for instance. Requirements to use it, you need Exxon Framework 3 right now. Um, if you want to use all functionality, that needs to be 3.2 because um, uh, there were some changes to the query bus. Uh, 3.0 and 3.1 will work as well, just not for queries, but they will work fine for commands and events. Uh, you will also need Exxon DB uh, if you want to process events through Exxon Hub. And there is, uh, just like for Exxon Hub, a free developer edition available uh, on our on our website. Um, so that's what I wanted to share. Again, the link to the product page. Uh, we have a couple of upcoming events that you may want to have a look at as well. Uh, and other than that, uh, we can take some questions now. <laughs>